The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. One of the most criticized parts of Scripture, no doubt, is the Genesis account of creation. Genesis is the book of beginnings, and it begins by telling us the answer to the most fundamental question that a person could ever ask. Where did everything come from? Now, Genesis gives us the answer to that question. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But it's been criticized by people all over the world. It's been criticized as being unscientific. It's been criticized as being too simple. It's been criticized as being contradictory to what nature tells us. But the fact of the matter is, it is what atheistic evolutionists tell us about origins that is contradictory to what nature actually tells us and to what God's Word tells us. I mean, think about this. Atheistic evolution says that everything ultimately came from nothing. It tells us that non-life evolved into life which evolved into totally different kinds of life over millions of years. It tells us that complex functional design in nature did not have a designer. It tells us that intelligence came from non-intelligence, that morality, if they believe in such, came from the amoral. Now that's what atheistic evolution tells us, but when you open up God's Word, you see that God gives us the ultimate cause of everything. And it is a a, uh, an appropriate cause because you see the law of causality, also known as the law of cause and effect, it says that every material effect must have an adequate antecedent or simultaneous cause. Every material effect must have an adequate antecedent or simultaneous cause. Now, what is the effect of this universe if we believe in atheistic evolution? Well, the, the, the cause of it, now the effect is the universe itself, but the cause of the universe, as has been told by atheistic evolutionists now for several decades, is basically the Big Bang that occurred 14 or so billion years ago from a period-sized ball of matter exploding, causing our entire gargantuan universe, not just causing our solar system, not just causing our solar system in our galaxy, not just causing the Milky Way galaxy, but every other galaxy in the universe. Now, is that a great enough cause to make such an effect? You see, actually what we read in Genesis chapter 1 is the great cause. Because Genesis chapter 1 tells us that that cause is infinite. He is uncaused. He is eternal. He is omnipotent, omniscient, non-physical. He is the spirit being that is defined in God's Word and is told in the very first verse of your Bible that it is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so the Bible, what you see, especially right here in Genesis chapter 1, one of the most criticized parts of all of Scripture gives us the rational cause for the effect that we know of as the universe. And think about this. The law of cause and effect is not the only law of science that agrees with what we see in nature and what we see in God's Word. The, the first law of thermodynamics, which is defined as in nature, matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed, goes perfectly along with what you see in God's Word. Because you see, in nature, in the physical realm, things don't just pop into existence, neither matter nor energy. In fact, this is uh, so well known, it has, it has perplexed even those who refer to themselves as atheistic evolutionists. I was reading an article a few years ago that appeared in New Scientist magazine, and the cover story was titled, The Beginning, What Triggered the Big Bang? And in that article, they gave several different possibilities for where the universe came from. All these different models. Well, maybe it was this, and maybe this is how it happened, and maybe that is how it happened. And so after giving several what they would call possibilities, I would say they would be several impossibilities, they then concluded this. And I think it is very telling what they conclude in this, uh, in this article. They said, Indeed, the quest to understand the origin of the universe seems destined to continue until we can answer a deeper question. Why is there anything at all instead of nothing? You see, if there is no God... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If there is no God, then you can't have the heavens and the earth. Why is that the case? Well, because you can't get something in nature from nothing. That is the first law of thermodynamics, which scientists all around the world recognize and they understand to be true. And it goes along perfectly with what we see in God's Word and specifically in the first chapter of the Bible. And then you have what scientists call the second law 
of thermodynamics, which is defined as in nature matter and energy become less usable over time. You see, since the end of creation, when God discontinued making the matter and energy of the universe, we talked about this yesterday where we talked about God rested, not that He needed to take a break and he, His energy level was low, but that He ceased creating. Well, the material universe began at that point in time, began running down. And so it is growing old like a garment, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. So again, what you see in Genesis chapter 1 agrees perfectly with the scientific law of causality, uh, the truism known as the law of cause and effect, with the first law of thermodynamics, with the second law of thermodynamics, and also with the law of biogenesis, which states, in nature, life comes from life and that of its own kind. Now, you know, in Genesis chapter 1, when you turn there, and you see the creation that God made on day three and on days five and six. What you will see repeatedly is the phrase, according to its kind. Now that's interesting. Right here in the first chapter of the Bible, because what you read there, according to its kind, really contradicts what the theory of evolution says. If anyone ever tells you that the theory of evolution and science go hand in hand, that simply is not true. It, it does not go hand in hand with true science. It does not go hand in hand with the Bible because true science uh, goes actually hand in hand with what the Bible says, including right here in the very first chapter of your Bible that is criticized fairly heavily involving the law of biogenesis. God said that on day three, He created vegetation according to its kind. That is, notice what it says here, according to its kind, verse 11 of Genesis chapter 1, whose seed is in itself. Verse 12, the herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. According to its kind. You see, the theory of evolution tells us, whether it be plants or animals, that you have these things that allegedly evolved over millions of years and then you had these things evolving into totally separate kinds of of living things, whether it be plants or animals. But you can go on down and read from there on days five and six of creation. Again, the animal kinds that God made, they were made according to their kinds. They would reproduce according to their kinds, which happens to go right along with what the law of biogenesis says. Now that law not only talks about life coming from life and that of its own kind, it also tells us that in nature, life comes from life, in nature. You see, life in nature, in the natural realm, does not pop into existence from non-life. So then, how did life ever get here to begin with? Well, it had to get here by supernatural cause. It had to, because the law of biogenesis says life doesn't pop into existence from nothing. And what we've been observing is that that law is true. In fact, we don't make up the laws the laws of science. We just recognize the world around us and see this is something that is true every day, day in and day out. And yet if the atheistic theory of evolution, the general theory of evolution is true, well, you had to have gotten life to come from non-life at some point in time in the past. I want you to see a quotation from a man who was a well-known scientist back in the middle 20th century who was a Nobel laureate of Harvard University and he stated in an article that he wrote, The Origin of Life in Scientific American, back long ago in, in, the, uh, in the middle 1950s. But he made a point that I believe is very powerful because he, he shows us that we basically have two options, two options for the origin of life. And this is what he said. He said the reasonable view was to believe in spontaneous generation, the only alternative to believe in a single primary act of supernatural creation. There is no third position. So he said you have two choices here. You have spontaneous generation. You have uh, the special creation by God. You have two choices. There is no third option, and truly he is correct about that. But then he went on to write in his article, most modern biologists having re reviewed with satisfaction the downfall of the spontaneous generation hypothesis, yet unwilling to accept the alternative belief in special creation, are left with nothing. I think, he said, that a scientist has no choice but to approach the origin of life through a hypothesis of spontaneous generation. You see what he said there? He said you have two options. But he chooses to believe in that which is unscientific, in that which he knows scientists have already shown to be untrue. But what you read right here in Genesis chapter 1 goes hand in hand with what nature actually tells us. And so don't let anyone ever tell you 
that God's Word and the Genesis account of creation is unscientific without kindly responding to them by saying, you know, the truth of the matter is what you read in Genesis chapter 1 goes hand in hand, goes perfectly with what we see in the natural world around us. Well, let's continue there in Genesis chapter 1 and look at another question that sometimes people ask. In fact, I was reading a book by a man named Bart Ehrman uh, recently titled, Jesus Interrupted. He was very critical of many things that the Bible writers wrote, including some things right here in Genesis chapter 1. And he made this statement on pages 9 and 10 of his, in his, of his book. He said, If light was created on the first day of creation in Genesis 1, how is it that the sun, moon, and stars were not created until the fourth day? Where was the light coming from if, if not the sun, moon, and stars? And how could there have been an evening and a morning on each of the first three days if there was no sun? So the question is, and it's a legitimate question, how did you have the sun, moon, and stars created on day four and you had light already on day one? How could you get light if the sun was not created until day four? Let me ask you this question. That's a good question, by the way. It's, 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 a, it's an appropriate question to ask because the sun is where we get most of our light here on earth. But is it true that the only way that you could get light on days one, two, and three is from the sun? I mean, think about this. Here's another way to ask this question. Can God, could God have produced another light that was shining on earth on days one, two, and three? Could God supernaturally, miraculously create light? Well, He certainly can. The Bible tells us that God is the Father of lights. The Bible tells us that God is light. So if God is the Father of lights, James chapter 1, verse 17, and He is light, then He could produce light on, days, on the first day of creation when He said, let there be light, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And that light could have been shining and providing light on earth on days 1, 2, and 3. And then He set the sun in its current place, creating it, making it along with the stars and the moon. And so there's no problem with God. I mean, there's going to be light in heaven one day that Christians are going to be able to enjoy. But that's not to say that we expect there to be a sun as we see it now in heaven. God can create light without having first to create the sun. I mean, think about it. Did God create vegetation on day 3? He certainly did. He made, he created, he made fruit bearing trees. But did he have to have a seed in order to first make that fruit bearing tree? Or is God, that's how we normally get our fruit bearing trees, right? That's normally how we get our vegetation. We get it from, from seeds. But you see, God could create that fruit bearing tree without first having to create a seed to make the tree. And he could create a light without having to have the sun. Now some might ask, appropriately so, in fact it was mentioned in the quotation by Bart Ehrman, well how could we have days on days one, two, and three if light wasn't created until day or if the sun was not created until day four? Well the fact of the matter is it is the rotation of the earth on its axis that really gives us a 24-hour day and, not whether, and, and really not whether we see the sun. Uh, there are people who live in parts of this earth. In fact, my dad right now is in Mormonsk, Russia. He's uh, about 1,000 miles north of Moscow. He's 150 to 200 miles above the Arctic Circle. And when he's there in the dead of winter, they rarely, if ever, see a sun. But do I ever call my dad up over there in Russia and he, tell, and he, he tells me, Eric, we haven't had a day around here in years. I mean, that wouldn't make sense, would it? How, how would you count years if you can't count a day? Of course, they have regular days even though they cannot see the sun. Now, others have asked this question, and I think it is a legitimate question to ask, but really there's a very rational answer to it. Regarding specifically day six of creation. You see, on day six of creation, the Bible tells us that, that, that Adam named various animals. And I want to read to you from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Genesis 2, 18 through 20, to see what God has revealed to us in His Word here. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not a helper comparable to him. Now, how could Adam have named every single species of animal on earth in a single day? 
Well, let me share with you a few points about this. First of all, Adam's task did not include searching for and gathering all of God's creatures. Rather, the text tells us that God brought them to Adam. So similar to how Noah didn't have to gather, go out and gather all over the world, all the different animals to take on his ark, the situation that Adam found himself in on day six of creation was not let me go and spend all of my time gathering animals and then bringing them here to Eden and let me name them. Also, Genesis 2.20 does not say that Adam named all of the animals on the earth. It says that Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. Excluded from this naming process were the sea creatures and, and creeping things mentioned earlier in the creation narrative. Furthermore, there are other limitations to uh, the phrase about Adam naming the animals because the beasts that God brought to Adam are qualified by the descriptive phrase of the field. The precise limits of the term field are, we don't know, but it is possible that it refers only to those beasts that were in Eden. I mean, think about it. If, if this referred really to all of the animals and, and you didn't pay close attention to some of these qualifying phrases, these descriptive phrases, then wouldn't Eden be quickly overrun with all sorts of animals from all over if people assume that's what he meant? You see, if the beasts of the field were limited to those animals within the boundaries of Eden, then livestock and birds could have also been similarly limited. And then finally, let me make this point about what Adam did on day six of creation. I believe this perhaps is the most crucial of all of these points. And it's that Adam did not have to name millions of species of animals on day six. Genesis 1 states that the animals were created according to their kinds, not species. The Bible was written long before the careless Linnaeus classification system. The word kind for, uh, for animals that, the, that Adam named there, that he named on the sixth day of creation, they were probably very broad, not, not specific like uh, some of the specific names or species that we have, but probably more like turtle and pig and dog and elephant rather than pig-nosed, soft-shell turtle or Alaskan husky. That would have taken a long time. But you know what else? I remember when my kids were really young. I remember when they were about two or three years old, they could go through an animal picture book and they could name, oh, I don't know, about one animal every two or three seconds in the book. And they could just flip pages, horse, dog, cow, moose, camel, and all the other animals. And they could just go through it very quickly. Now, if, if a child who is two or three years old can go through a picture book of animals and name them or recall their names that quickly. Is it not possible that the man who's, who was created by the very hand of God could not name a variety of animals in a rather short period of time? Let me also mention this because it gets brought up some about uh, the sixth day of creation and allegedly Adam not being able to name all of these animals in a short period of time, pr probably uh, 30 minutes or a few hours there on day six of creation. Some have thought, well, maybe the days of creation were much longer than we thought because Adam had to do this. There are some, I think, uh, perhaps well-meaning Christians who are wondering, well, can we, should we lengthen those days? Is it possible? Does the text allow for that? Well, the fact is, the word day is used in Scripture in a variety of ways. The word day can mean the opposite of night. We find it that way there in the first part of Genesis chapter 1. It can refer to a period of time in the future. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Or it can refer to a literal day. But when you look in Genesis chapter 1, what you find is over and over again, it's used to refer to a regular day. And you have to determine how the word day is used by the context. And what you find in Genesis chapter 1 is that each day, verse 5, had an evening and a morning. So the first day had an evening and a morning. And you go down day after day after day, and what you find is day 2, verse 8. So the evening and the morning were the second day. So the evening and the morning were the third day, verse 13 of Genesis chapter 1. Each day had an evening and a morning. That is a period of darkness and a period of daylight. You recall that the Jews counted their days from evening to evening and so the wording maybe in 21st century America we might rather prefer uh, day and night or morning and evening but they counted their days from evening to evening. You know the words evening and morning they're used many times in the Old Testament and throughout the Old Testament these words are associated with normal 24-hour days in non-prophetical literature. When you go through, if you just did a word search for the word evening and morning and you look at the context in which you find those words throughout Scripture in non-prophetical literature, it's overwhelmingly about regular days. 
And there's no reason to think that these days in Genesis chapter 1 were not regular days. In fact, when you think about day 3 of creation and the vegetation that we talked about earlier that was made on day 3 of creation, could you imagine if that day was really a long period of time like millions of years or billions of years as some theistic evolutionists would have us believe about that? What, what, what would happen to plant life and, and vegetation during a million years or a half a million years or half a billion years of darkness? Well, they would die because vegetation, most vegetation, needs light in order to survive. Furthermore, the word day is modified here in Genesis chapter 1 several times with a number, with a numerical adjective. I want you to see what Arthur Williams wrote in his Creation Research Annual several years ago about this very point. He said, We have failed to find a single example of the use of the word day in the entire scripture where it means other than a period of 24 hours when modified by the use of of the numerical adjective. Now, if that's the case, then why would we think in Genesis chapter 1 we ought to interpret it some other way? The truth is, we don't have to. The Bible tells us in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Furthermore, let me just make one or two more points along this line, and then I'll move on to our next point, and that is that the word day is used in its plural form. It appears that way hundreds of times in the Old Testament, including Exodus chapter 20, and verse 11. Now, when you find it in its plural form, it is always a reference in non-prophetical literature to 24-hour days like we see right here in Genesis chapter 1. I believe that the evidence that these were regular days is overwhelming. Furthermore, you have the word days and years used in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. And so if we can't understand how the word day is used in Genesis 1, wouldn't it be pretty hopeless to understand how the word year is used? I mean, if, if the word day in Genesis 1 means millions of years or billions of years, then pray tell, what does the word year mean in Genesis chapter 1? You do have some people who talk about 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, and they'll say, you know, 2 Peter 3, 8, doesn't it tell us that the days of creation were really a thousand years long? One day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, some proclaim. Actually, the text doesn't say one day is a thousand years. It says that one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. It's a, it's a figure of speech. And the only reason that we understand really what Peter is saying there by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is because we understand the difference between a day and a thousand years. Furthermore, Peter, again, writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wasn't even talking about how long the days of creation were. He was talking about the second coming of Christ and about how there were people who were scoffing at the idea that Jesus would return. And he said, referring to the promise of his return, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That is the promise of his return. Uh, Peter says, well, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day with the Lord. That is, time does not have an effect on God's promises. Unlike us, you know, my, my daughter might say, well, you know, I'll take out the trash tomorrow, Dad. And then she might forget to do that tomorrow because time elapses. Or my son might say, hey, I'm going to wash the, I'm going to wash the car uh, next week or I'm going to mow the yard next week. Oftentimes, we forget to do those things, do we not? And sometimes it is not on purpose. Sometimes just time elapses and we just forget. Well, God does not forget, which is, I believe, his point there in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 and has nothing to do with how long the days of creation were. One last point I'd like to make along this line is this. Notice that the Holy Spirit could inspire a, a New Testament writer to uh, communicate the idea of a thousand years and communicate the idea of a day. So the Holy Spirit can do that if He so chooses. Well, if that's the case, then why did He call the times of creation in Genesis chapter 1 days and not a thousand years or a million years or some other long period of time? Let's look at another question that people ask from Genesis chapter 1. Did God create animals or man first? Genesis chapter 1 verses 20 through 28, you read that God made animals and then He made man. But in Genesis chapter 2 verses 18 and 19, we see this statement, which we've already read, part of it anyway. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what He would call them. So. Did God make animals, did He create animals after creating Adam or before creating Adam? Now according to Hebrew scholars, the word yatsar, translated form there in Genesis chapter 2, could easily be translated had formed. That's very possible. 
Now, I realize that there would be skeptics who would say, well, you know, it, it's not really that way and, and you can't have that. You can't have that translation just because it, it makes the answer to this question a little easier. But the fact is, it's true. Hebrew scholars agree on this. Commentators Kyle and Delitz noted that our modern style for expressing the same thought would be simply this. God brought to Adam the beast which he had formed. In fact, there is a widely used translation, the New International Version, that renders the verb in Genesis 2.19 not as the past tense, but as the pluperfect. It reads this way, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. The insistence, Herbert Leupold wrote in his book, Exposition of Genesis, he said the insistence of the critics upon a plan Upon a, upon a plain past is partly the result of the attempt to make chapters 1 and 2 clash at as many places as possible. The main reason that skeptics do not see harmony in the events recorded in the first two chapters of the Bible is because they fail to realize that Genesis chapter 1 and 2 serve different purposes. I want you to see a quotation by a man, a scholar of the 20th century, who uh, was very well informed about the ancient Orient and the Old Testament. In fact, he wrote a book about that, titled that very phrase, Ancient Orient and the Old Testament. And Kenneth Kitchen uh, made this statement, made this observation. Genesis chapter 1, he said, mentions the creation of man as the last of a series and without any details. Whereas in Genesis chapter 2, we have there the, uh, the center of interest and, uh, and more specific details are given about him and his setting. Failure to recognize the complementary nature of the subject distinction between a skeleton outline of all creation on the one hand and the, the concentration and the detail of, uh, on man and his immediate environment on the other borders on obscurantism. Now, you see, if someone does not recognize that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 that they serve different purposes, then they're probably going to have a difficult time understanding the differences in, in the two. You see, Genesis chapter 1 is given in chronological order. Genesis chapter 2 is written topically. Genesis chapter 1 is written in, a, in more of the form of an outline, while Genesis chapter 2 gives more details, especially about day 6 of creation. Now, as we begin to wind down this session on the reliability of the creation account, alleged discrepancies as they relate to Genesis chapter 1. Let me mention another one as it really relates to creation but happens just a little bit after that. Because you see, God tells us in His Word that He created the first original couple, Adam and Eve. But if Adam and Eve really were the first two human beings and the only two human beings that God specially created, then who did their children marry? Who did the children of Adam and Eve marry? Did they marry their siblings? Can you imagine? And you think about your brother or your sister and the idea of marrying them. Maybe you think of the Old Testament laws like Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, and Deuteronomy 27 and laws in those chapters that indicate sexual relations between close family members is sinful and punishable by death. So how is it if that is the case that Adam and Eve had children and their children must have must have married each other. How was that lawful? Well, Adam, Eve, and their children, you have to recall, were not under the law of Moses. The laws regarding incest were part of the law of Moses, which was not established for the Israelites until after they departed Egypt around 1500 B.C. And whether you like it or not, incest was not wrong in the beginning. Indeed, it is implied at creation and it occurred among even Noah's family after the flood, at least among cousins. Uh, because there was only Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their three spouses on the ark at that time. Now some might ask, well, Eric, uh, wouldn't there be problems there with them marrying uh, their siblings early on in creation? Well, I want to read to you a quotation that uh, comes from an article that Trevor Major co-wrote years ago at Apologetics Press. He said, there was no need for strict laws on marriage partners in the early patriarchal age, apart from the divine one man, one woman for life institution. And for at least one good reason, during this time man was in a relatively pure state, at least physically, having left not long before the perfect condition in which he was created in the garden that, that sustained his life. No harmful genetic traits had emerged at this point uh, that, could have been, that could have been expressed in the children of closely related Partners. He went on in, in this article to say, However, after many generations, and especially after the Noahic flood, Genesis 6 through 9, solar and cosmic radiation, chemical and viral mutagens, and DNA replication errors led to the multiplication of genetic disorders, 
God protected His people by instituting strict laws against incestuous marriages in the 18th chapter of Leviticus. And so it would not have been inappropriate for Adam and Eve's children to marry each other. Now, one last thing I would like to say about, about Cain is, and, uh, and about who he and Abel and others would have married, is whether or not there ever was another people living at the time of Adam, Eve, and Cain. Because you recall that after Cain killed Abel, the Bible tells us that he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. The land of Nod. Does the land of Nod, is the fact that Genesis chapter 4 verses 16 and 17, the fact that it mentions the land of Nod, does that mean that there was a people there living in the land of Nod? Actually, the word Nod there is used and it is used in a, in a figurative speech, if you will. That is, it is a case or an example of prolepsis where there is an assignment of something such as, as an event or a name, like the name of a town or a place, to a time that precedes it. You see, Cain was, uh, he was sentenced by God to be a vagabond or to be a wanderer. You know what the name Nod means? It, it is believed to come from the word wandering or a wanderer. And so it is most likely that that name was given not after Cain went there, but when Moses was writing this down years later, he was referring to a place where Cain would go and where he would dwell, and it became known as the land of Nod, and Moses went ahead and inserted this there in Genesis chapter 4. There was not another group of people specially created by God because the Bible tells us that Adam was the first man and that Eve was the mother of all living. Isn't it great to have confidence in Genesis chapter 1? I realize there may be skeptics and critics who are watching this video and they may be saying, well, I have other questions about Genesis chapter 1. I would encourage you to visit the Apologetics Press website if you have an opportunity to look at many of the other questions that are asked that we have answered there and we believe there are reasonable answers to those questions. It may be that you have other questions that you would like to write in to Apologetics Press located at 230 Landmark Drive in Montgomery, Alabama. You are free to do that. We're not always able to answer all of our email and mail because of the amount that we get, but it may be that we're able to write at some point in time on the question that you may have about these very subjects. Sure appreciate you being with us in this class on alleged discrepancies as they relate to the Genesis account of creation. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.